to ask questions as well. So I'm going to ask Patty to go first this time. So I said um, I didn't want to be asked any questions. <laughs> yes, she, she did. Um, so you've shared your background, and we've heard from the other panelists. So what do you think, and I'm going to ask each of the panelists this question, what do you think are the key attributes that are required for today's general counsel? Well, I, I think there are a, a lot of things that that are really helpful to have. But if I had to pick out two key attributes, and the first one is hard work. There just is no substitute for hard work. So there's hard work learning your craft generally in the early years. There's hard work when, when problems come your way. You really have to do the groundwork to understand the problems. Um, I just, I, 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 as, we, as we talked in preparation for this panel, a lot of things that we talked about brought back that theme, that, that there's no substitute for it. And the second thing I think is, is also the thing you must have is good judgment. And I guess I would say that I've met enough people, and probably you have, to know that not everyone is actually born with good judgment. Um, and, some, and some people have exceptionally good judgment. But I do think that that most people have the ability to develop and to better their judgment. And so if you spend time observing people in organizations who are highly respected and who you respect, you begin to hone your own sense of judgment because, <clears throat> excuse me, judgment comes in both in the way you have to deal with problems that come your way and in terms of how, what solutions you come up with, what are the best solutions, which items are important and which aren't important, um, and also comes in a lot if you're in a general counsel role or another part of a team role in an, in an enterprise, judgment comes up in how you sell what you need to sell to everybody else who's in that group with you. That's great. David, your thoughts? You know, I, I have seen over a 30-plus year career, so I'm always on the outside. I've worked for general counsel as a lawyer, and now general counsel are you know, senior members of the uh, executive management team, and so we also work closely with them, even though I'm in a financial advisory role. But I have seen a huge evolution in the role of general counsel and, you know, my professional experience. So when I first started, Many companies didn't even have general counsel. I mean, why do you need a general counsel? You've got a law firm, and you had kind of a monogamous relationship with a law firm. That's the way it used to work back then. And, you know, they kind of handled all the legal work. And then law firms realized that, you know, we, we kind of need, I mean, companies realized that we need somebody to kind of manage this stuff on a day-to-day -day basis. And so the position of general counsel was created. But it was more of a... Um, uh, issue, financial issue, legal issue, it's hard to tell who the general counsel is at times because the, the, the role of the general counsel has expanded beyond, you know, the, the four corners of providing legal advice. And it's, it's much more of a strategic role. It's much more of a management role. Um, and, you know, you really stole my, my thunder with your emphasis on the word judgment because, you know, aside from the obvious, work hard, know your stuff, got to do that. But, you know, what distinguishes those general counsel who are really superb um, from those who aren't um, are those who have this kind of innate ability to, you know, any problem that works its way up to sort of the top four in the company is by, by definition a tricky one. You know, if it, was, if it was obvious, then those four people wouldn't be worried about it. And so 
by definition, there are trade-offs, there's ambiguities, there are pluses and minuses, the decision isn't obvious. And you know, the, the most effective general counsel and really the most effective managers, not just in the GC role, are those who have the wisdom and experience and ability to see the big picture, the big picture in many respects going far beyond what might be a, a, a legal issue, and to think several steps down the road. You know, and to understand if we do this, then what kind of precedent are we creating? What issues might this create for us in, you know, these three transactions that we have in the queue? Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I just don't remember seeing that early in my career. So I, I think there's been a, a major evolution of the role of general counsel from nothing to, you know, one of the, um, you know, senior most members of an effective executive management team. I think it's um, three things. Um, I, I agree with everything that's been said here. It's it's the, the knowledge of your craft in terms of what is needed, um, what, what are the major laws and things that you need to counsel on in your given company, right? It's uh, an ability to influence people to listen to you, and that it puts into your, your presence, your willingness to stand up and, and speak, and then it's courage uh, because, quite frankly, there are times when, for whatever reason, uh, many companies, I mean, everybody is driven in a profit motive, and you don't typically have people that don't want to do things for the right reasons. They all want to make money and do things to help their customers. Uh, but you have to be able to look at what is before the company, look at the risks that they're being exposed to as a result of that, and be able to really be courageous and speak up if you think that the path that they're going down is going to get you in deep crap, right? <laughs> <laughs> and being able to do that uh, in a way that um, will have the influence uh, that you need to have, you have to be very savvy in how you do that. And that is the difference between um, how I look at the role of outside counsel versus the role of general counsel. Um, I can hire people to tell me, you know, what does the FDA law say about X, Y, Z? Um, I can talk about what is, you know, is this a kickback risk or is this not or, or whatnot and have people write me opinions about that. But people don't, outside counsel don't know the people within my company, don't know where the gaps are in terms of knowledge, don't know where implementation risks <coughs> might be the biggest, uh, don't understand the business of, you know, a place where you have multiple generics uh, where you're trying to sell the same thing and how do you influence a person to do that versus not. Uh, in a lawful and compliant way. And so what we can do is we can really embed that underlying knowledge that of the law, but also look at what really is the, the thing that drives the business and put in mitigation strategies to make sure that what your company is doing uh, will put you on the right side of things and having the right ability to do that. Now, I can tell you, when I went to undergraduate school, I, I man majored in political science and psychology. I use psychology more than anything, <laughs> right? Because when you're talking about influence, you have to figure out what it is that is going to influence this person to do what they need to do. And to do that, you have to be self-aware of how what your style is of influence and what is really going to make a difference to this person and to craft your arguments such that it makes it very clear that that's the only thing that they can do and it's something that they want to do and that they care about. I, I want to... <clears throat> you raised such an interesting point because I think one of the things that we're called upon to do in these roles, mm -hmm. um, y you raised the point about courage. You do have to be able to say no, but that has to be about a half a percent of the time. Mm -hmm. The rest of the time that you initially come to know, what you have to really be able to figure out is how to tell them yes, how to do mm -hmm. it in a different way right. um, and, and get to yes, although you do need the courage to say no when you know that no is the only answer. Yeah, well, exactly. No, it's, and, and knowing your business enough to be able to ask questions to figure out how do you right. get to yes. Right. A couple of follow-up themes. From my experience, um, I do think that influence is important, the ability to say no, and generally in-house, if, you, if your clients see you working in the trenches with them day in and day out and, and observe you um, working the 99.5% of the time mm -hmm. <laughs> trying to get them to yes, 
um, and your creative energy around that and your passion and helping them solve their business problems, then when you do actually say no, they stop. Mm -hmm. And they say, she said no, <laughs> this must be serious. Um, if you constantly are an awfulizer and, and, and saying, oh, the risk, um, then you know, people either won't come talk to you or you know, they, they will go around you. And so it's a very um, sensitive balance to demonstrate that, that you're on their side um, but while keeping your objectivity, uh, because that's our role. We have ethical responsibilities to do that. Um, I also want to talk just a little bit about what I think some competencies are. We, we hear the theme through this panel, but it really is having not only broad-based experience in, in knowing your craft, but being able to take on different roles. If I look back about you know, the different positions I've held and I put uh, you know, a chart on the board, or I whiteboarded my, my past, I can pluck from all my different experiences and piece together little things that helped along the way to help me be successful in a role. So when you're looking at a role um, that the company um, may ask you to take, pause, think about it, and see if, you're, if it's designed in a way that you can be successful um, doing that role. Um, that will, and, and Laura talked about that in her remarks, pick your boss, pick your employer, but also look at the role and make sure that it's designed in a way and that you have the right experience and the right team to help you. And then finally, I would say in terms of the general counsel role, um, and, and David did a great job talking about the evolution of the general counsel really over the last 30 years, if you look at the research and you really think about how general counsels have taken on a more prominent role in the company. I don't have any data like Laura did, I wish I did, but I, I'm, I have this hypothesis that I will throw out to the group here that where the general counsel sits in the company and who the general counsel reports to um, matters for the tone and culture of that organization. So if you're contemplating leaving a firm or you're contemplating going into a corporate career at a law school, <coughs> the best advice, I think, is to look at where the general counsel sits. Does the general counsel report to the CEO? Is the general counsel part of the strategy and decision-making team? Generally, those companies are catching issues sooner. The legal function is valued. Um, one of my old bosses used to say, you know, we're just another business person. We just happen to wear a legal hat. And so that's really important. And, you know, not all companies are structured in that manner. So we thought it would be helpful advice to point that out to folks who are looking at general counsel jobs or even lower level in-house jobs because you could find once you get in that if the general counsel is really not a, a, a senior member of management, then that culture could, could not be satisfactory. So we're gonna turn on to the next question, which is um, we know that, and we've talked about, that today's general counsel operates in a complex global environment. So, which requires strong risk analysis and risk management skills. Boards and senior management must take risk, and business is risk taking. This is an area where the general counsel plays an important strategic role, being the trusted advisor to help guide senior management and boards in making well reasoned, and this is key, risk adjusted strategic decisions that build value for the corporation and shareholders. And I'd like the panel to share with us some experiences in your career where you've added strategic value in the risk management sense. So Paula, I'll turn it over to you first. Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, one of the times that I think I added the most strategic value was when I um, was in Europe and I uh, sat through business plans and had sat through, I think, two business plans mm -hmm. before this time. And I had learned uh, through work with a lot of the general counsels at the affiliates uh, that I supervised a lot about European law uh, one of the major challenges that we had at that time was there was a huge shortfall with what our plan was going to be versus what we, you know, thought we could really make. Um, and I sat there and I said, you know, there is a way for us to do something with our supply chain that could really uh, bring maybe another $50 million to the bottom line. And we began devising a strategy where we could lawfully um, look at how we could do that within the bounds of antitrust law within uh, the EU. People were quite, you know, the legal group is bringing this up and they're actually gonna be a profit center. Um, but it was a, a strategy, a strategy that we devised and then we looked at tactically how we would be able to do this. Uh, and it was really by looking at, you know, what did we need to make in each country uh, to supply 
uh, our products in those countries? How could we make sure that people within certain countries did make sure ex they had exactly what they needed to have in those countries to serve uh, the patients within those countries, but not necessarily uh, stuff that they could send to countries where we could get higher prices, uh, but not uh, do that. And so it was really uh, a, a way to, to listen and look at what the law was how we needed to implement it very carefully to make sure that we were within the bounds of the law, but to use it to the company's um, competitive advantage. Um, and so we did that, and I can say that uh, we ended up, well, we got sued for it, but the, <laughs> um, but we won. <laughs> we won, and, uh, and it's still in place today. See, it was risk adjusted. Mm -hmm. It yeah, was. You did it up front. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's right. Okay. Patty, you want to go now? Well, I, I can go back to something I talked about earlier, which is what I was called in to do when I first went to work for DeBartolo. <clears throat> and it's now far enough away and far enough past the statute of limitations that I can discuss it. <laughs> um, but th they, they, had a, uh, they had an interesting issue because the, the patriarch of the family had passed away and he had gotten estate planning advice, poor estate planning advice from a very good firm, but his estate planning, planning advice was, uh, was directed at his charitable impulses, which were enormous. And so when he passed away, his, uh, there was a good portion of his estate that was placed into a charitable foundation, which is, which is a wonderful thing, not a great way to own a football team. Um, <clears throat> so I had to come in and, and speak to a lot of experts and get ideas about conclusions and uh, about possible solutions and then work through, you talked about getting to know your own client, work through what, what worked for us and we ended up being able to come up with a solution that we implemented over several years that accomplished three things that were all important to the family. First and most importantly, we did end up um, and with a solution that enabled us to, to give literally millions and millions of dollars to, to a number of deserving charities. Um, secondly, we ended up with um, ownership of the team back in the family. Uh, and third, we figured out as we were doing this along the way that we could avoid some issue with the next generation of estate planning by doing our series of transactions in a way where the ownership movement went to the second generation down so that when this current adult generation passes away, we don't run into exactly the same issue they were trying to plan for the first time. So it was, it was fascinating to me. I, I was able to learn things that I never knew anything about before that, that I actually, because I have worked with closely held businesses through my, since my law firm days, um, have been able to apply over and over again in other situations, so it's a lot of fun. David, can you comment on this question? Well, never having worked in a company, mm -hmm. I can't <clears throat> point to an example that you know I've been involved in. Um, but what I think I can comment on is is you know what what are the skills required to do it? And I think I want to go back to something that Laura said because it, it's just such good advice that um, it probably bears repeating. And that is to, um, <clears throat> to, to make sure that you understand the numbers and make sure you know finance. Because business is numbers and business is finance. And you cannot be an effective advisor to a company if you don't understand the financial implications and the financial underpinnings of the issue that um, you, know, you are called upon to address. I actually think that, you know, in addition to the, the guidance Laura gave you as to how one might go about acquiring the advice, which is uh, excellent recommendations, I actually think it's, at least in my experience, because I didn't have any financial background at all when um, I graduated from law school. Now everything I do is finance, so I've completely reverse engineered myself. Um, but when I, I think about how, um, you know, my life was as a, as a young lawyer, what I tried to do without you know, thinking this is gonna be good for my career so I'm gonna do it, I was just interested, was to understand what was going on behind, you know, what was the deal here and you know, what, were the, what was the financial objective of the company and to, to just look behind the law and understand the, the financial dynamics of, of that situation, which really nobody had asked me to do that, but it was right there in front of me 
And I think that's a really great effective way to understand finances, to make sure that you, you know, dig down deep below the law. And, um, you know, sometimes where you just don't get it, you ask the business people. And, you know, my experience is that they're only too willing to, to help in it and explain. So I, I think the best way to have a strategic impact and to position yourself as a professional to, you know, be this senior executive st strategic advisor to the company, in addition to everything else we've talked about, is to make sure that you have a very solid grounding in the financial dynamics of your company, because without that, um, you know, you're, you're very limited in your effectiveness. I'd like to say to that, um, I went to law school because I hated math, you know, and so it really, you know, I thought, my goodness, but it is so important. I have to echo what you're saying. And what I did uh, was I found a friend in finance who happens now to be our CFO. But he, when I when we moved to Europe, I said, you know, I don't know. I don't understand all this stuff. You need to, he says, you know what? You ask me any stupid question you think from finance, and I'll do the same with you for legal. <laughs> so you, I established a partnership with someone where I could say, OK, you need to help me understand this. And I did the same for them. And I think that if you can add, subtract, multiply, and divide, you can understand a balance sheet. So. Actually, the patriarch mm -hmm. of <laughs> Lazard, who you know is long gone, and I think it's really true, he said, "You all you need is a fourth grade understanding mm -hmm. of math to do business finance," mm -hmm. and I think that's absolutely true. You know, finance and math are two different things entirely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Early, early on in my career, someone who was a few years older than I mm -hmm. said to me, "What you need to do is start reading articles in the in the Wall Street Journal every day." She Great said, you, "You won't understand what they are." when you start reading them, and, and, then, and you will never remember any of the numbers when you start reading them, because the numbers will sound so outrageous. But the more you read them, the more those subjects become familiar. And she was right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great observations um, on that topic. Thank you. Our next topic, um, this is one I'm completely passionate about, so I've subjected the panel to this, <laughs> um, is talent. And retaining talent, growing talent, managing talent, um, and I think it's just of strategic importance in, in our environment and into the future. So I think corporations who get that um, are going to be the winners in the end. And I think um, one place where companies can also look at their talent what, um, is in the legal department. More now than when I started in house counsel, I've had these conversations with HR that are along the lines of, tell me again why the lawyers aren't in the leadership development program. <laughs> um, what's the reasoning for that? You want us to give great business advice, yet you are not t arming us with the same tools that uh, your line uh, folks are. So um, I want to hear from the panel about um, talent management and development of talent in, in in-house legal departments, particularly global ones, because it's really a global fight for talent. I'm going to turn the question over to Paula, and I'm going to ask for follow-up from David on this one. Um, Talent development is, is key um, to the success of our, our company. If we expect people to be uh, the partners uh, with the business and to, to help the, the company be successful, we need to make sure that they are armed with the best tools possible. So when someone starts uh, within our um, legal department, we begin with um, assigning them a coach. Um, there's a, a peer coach, and then you all also always have, um, of course, the person that supervises them. But the peer coach is there because you need somebody that's going to, you can ask the crazy questions to that you don't think is going to be the one signing your evaluation at the end of the day. Um, and so we do that. Um, we also have a performance management system, which says that every year you establish what your objectives are for the given year. Uh, and that should be basically, you know, this is what I'm going to do. These are the tasks I'm going to do. But then a part of that is also, this is what my development plan is going to be in terms of uh, what I'm going to be when I grow up kind of thing. Now, what that, what that means is you need to have a real discussion with folks around what is it that you really want, right? Not everybody wants to be the general counsel. Um, some people want to be very deep uh, in a given subject matter area, and we clearly need those folks that want to be deep in a certain subject matter area. Not everybody can lead the company. Some people um, can will be very happy doing other things, and others do want to do that. But you need to have that real dialogue with folks about what is it that really drives you and that you really want. And then once you have that discussion, you start laying out, OK, where are the gaps? OK, that you, that's what you want. You want to be the next general counsel. 
these are the attributes that you need to have in order to do that and then let's figure out how we're going to over time make sure that you are equipped um, to, to do that. I can tell you the example that I had when I first, um, again, when I went to Europe, I, my, my, my goal when I went there, I was the second general counsel that went from, from Lilly, uh, lived in London there. My goal was to, when I, once I left, that really I didn't think we needed to have another U.S. general counsel, that we really needed to have somebody from Europe that could do this for, you know, the folks there in Europe. I mean, they could leave their group. I mean, why not? Uh, but that had never been thought of because we're a 130-year-old company and it's best based in Indianapolis, Indiana, and that's where the connections are, and so the general counsel needs to come from there. I um, kind of, after looking and sussing up the folks that were there, decided I, there are two people here that I could see that I, I think, you know, with some development could be uh, the next general counsel. And I remember talking to the person who is now <coughs> the general counsel for Europe uh, and saying to her, okay, I, don't you think, she was like, oh, she thought I was crazy. There was no <laughs> way that she could ever do this. I said, well, well let's just kind of see what we can do here. And we just kind of laid out things of how she could uh, build her expertise, build her influencing skills, lay out experiences that she needed to have and master in order to feel that confidence that she would need to have uh, to do that. And I can tell you, within a number of years, we just talked uh, the other, she said, oh, I thought you were crazy and you, you didn't know who you were talking to. But here today, that's what she does uh, for our company. That's a great story. So, so it is, it's, it's really just having, um, laying out your plan and walking through it and asking uh, the right questions of folks as you do it. Uh, talent development, talent maintenance is, um, you know, absolutely essential for any uh, professional services firm. I mean, you're only as good as your people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we operate in a very competitive environment. There are many other firms who do what we do for a living. And so, you know, why do we win? Um, uh, we win because we have the best people and we have the best team. So it's, it's absolutely essential that, um, you know, we, we, we don't have a formal program. Um, you know, maybe we should be more formalized, although we're, you know, pretty small organization. Um, but y you know who the people are who you want to keep. And we don't, we're not always successful. Sometimes you lose people that you wouldn't want to lose. But, you know, a huge effort is made to um, keep the job interesting and exciting for, you know, those who we want to stick around for a long time. I, I want to say a, a word along these lines. Um, about the subject of mentoring, which, um, you know, I, as I look back on my career, um, you know, it, it occurs to me that not only is it, when you think about mentor-mentee relationships, and it's certainly good advice to find a mentor, latch on to a mentor, um, but I, I think that as much as the um, mentee finding the mentor, the mentor finds the mentee. And that probably, if you really look at how these relationships begin, I bet it's more times that than the other. Um, and why is it? They're just, you know, certain people who stand out from the beginning. You know, they work a little harder, um, they care a little more about the job, and I don't mean necessarily that they're the ones who are there till nine o'clock at night, you know, sitting in their office to be there at nine o'clock at night. But, these are the people who are inquisitive, who are energetic, who don't stay in their lane, who want to learn more about the business, who are making an additional investment um, in expanding their horizons. And senior people are attracted to you know, the, the, the younger uh, individuals in the organization, and, and you want to help them. Um, and I think the flip side is also true. If, if, if you're you know, a, a substandard employee, it doesn't matter, you know, how hard you try to, to, to latch on to someone as your mentor, it's not going to work. Um, and so I think it's, it's important to be strategic in terms of, you know, who you work for and who you attach yourselves to. But I think, um, you know, more times than not, just doing a great job and, I mean, you got to love being there. If you don't love being there, it's never going to work. No matter how hard you try, if you get up in the morning and you hate your job, you're not going to be good at it. Um, but if you, if you show the, you know, the enthusiasm and the dedication and the willingness to learn and you have excitement for what you're doing, um, I think you'll find that, uh, you know, you'll have your choice of mentors. 
in most organizations. That's a great segue, David, into the, into the question that, that we, we talked about. So we're, gonna, we're going to skip around here on our list and we're gonna move towards the idea of the importance it is for particularly women professionals to have sponsors as they progress through their careers. Um, and I'd like Paula and Patty to talk a little bit about um, how they d developed relationships with sponsors. Do they have them? Um, what critical ro role did they play? You just gave an example of how you were a sponsor to the European GC mm -hmm. and the development of a role that the company just didn't see, which I will describe as female vision um, <laughs> in work. Um, so, Patty, you want to talk about sponsorship a little bit? Yeah, and I was, I was intrigued, Laura, by your remark earlier because I hadn't really focused on the difference between a mentor and a sponsor. And I, I will say in my early career at the large Chicago law firm, I had a wonderful mentor. Um, she was... She was way ahead of her time in terms of, she was a highly respected, very visible partner in the real estate department, which, which in 1977, there weren't that many, there were not that many women partners at any large law, law firm, and she was just tremendous. And yet, she cared so much about, about making a wide path for the women coming behind her, that she was remarkable both in her personal relationships, but also in what she modeled for the rest of us who were relatively early in the process. Um, then when I came to the midsize firm in Cleveland, I had, and I thought about this as you talked this morning, I had somebody I would more consider a sponsor. And, and this was a man, and he was the senior managing partner of the firm, and he was um, highly respected in his field. and. He was in the same field I wanted to be in, and so he was more of a opening doors for me, both teaching me and opening doors for me in particular. And so I was thinking, David, as you talked, that, um, that I think there are really two important things to keep in mind, and, and one is that, is that when you latch on, in, in addition to loving your, your place and, and, and developing respect for what you're doing, you have to pick someone in the organization, or you have to hope you've got someone in the organization who's willing to sponsor or mentor you who is highly respected in the organization. And the other thing is that I think it ought to be someone with whom you can develop a real personal relationship because I think that that just expands what that person is willing to share with you and what you're willing to share with that person and, and enables you to talk about things to get over some of the rough spots in the early time and, and to share both ways in a, in a trusting um, environment. So I think those two things are important in the relationships. I told you when I joined Lilly that um, I started in litigation and quickly went to our animal health division. Um, our animal health division, uh, or it was our agricultural and animal health division at the time. We sold that later, but now it's just animal health. But anyway, at the time we had both. And um, there were two of us. There was uh, the general counsel and me uh, that were part of this company that were doing the legal services. Well, she, uh, her name was Becky Goss at the time. She. Um, later married, and it was Rebecca Kendall. Um, it, she ended up being the general counsel for Eli Lilly and Company. Um, so I worked with her very closely as one of two uh, in that group, and so she did really pull me along every step of the way um, of her career. And how we did that was really a, a matter of developing a relationship. Of course, me doing the work and you know, making you know, the right choices and uh, counseling people as she would be happy that I would be counseling them. But along the way, just really becoming friends. Um, and not only uh, with her, but with others on the management uh, team as well. And how I did that was quite frankly not just, you know, it was really letting people see who I was as a person, stopping by people's offices and letting them know what my aspirations were, um, telling people this is what I think I can do. Where do you see uh, that I can develop in this way? Um, being very clear and transparent about where I wanted my career to go and what jobs I thought would help me, but being open to the feedback uh, that they would provide to me in terms of what would be the best thing for me. Being very clear about what I didn't want um, as well. Uh, I think that that was uh, very important. And I can say by doing that, um, I always did get to do things that I wanted to do and never got to do something that I said, please don't ever put me in the bankruptcy department. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. You know, I just, or, or actually, you know, I think you would have been very good at right. it. You know, but, but, you know, just being very clear and transparent yeah. and letting people right. know and understand that. 
I think, um, I think a lot of the comments here go, I, I'm, Laura did such a great job setting this up today, um, talking about self-awareness and understanding your strengths and weaknesses also help find an effective sponsor and you want a sponsor who's going to tell you maybe what you don't want to hear because when you're in, in the moment and you're kind of self-absorbed, it's really sometimes hard to pull back and a sponsor will often say to you, you know, you might want to consider this opportunity or you may want to work on this in a way that you may not see. So that I think they're critical to your professional development. We have 10 minutes left on this panel, so. And you were uh, worried whether we could I was it. worried. I admit whether we were going to you not know, have enough to say, and I was wrong. <laughs> um, so, if, is everyone okay? Did you want to talk about any other comments before we move to questions? We're good. Okay. We're good. Let's open it up for questions then from the audience, please. We're we're happy to spend the next ten minutes in a conversation. Don't be shy. Okay. <laughs> All three of these stories are, are really interesting. Patty, one thing though that intrigues me about your story is that you you stepped out of both the law firm environment and, and for a while the work environment. And that career path is one that a lot of women I think are exploring, but it, it makes us very nervous because we know we want to come back at some point and we're concerned that we won't be able to get back into the workforce. So I, I'm not sure if you can talk a little bit more about mm -hmm that experience and um, just any words of wisdom you have? Well, I actually found in both of my maternity leaves that, the, that coming back after three months off was a pretty hard adjustment. Not, I'm not talking about in terms of time, in terms of regaining my footing, in terms of having a sense that um, I, I was still on top of my game. So I, I noticed a little of that even before I stepped back. I'll say a couple of things about it. Um, one is that I, I never did entirely step out, and so that was a little bit of a help to me. I still kept two clients who knew they could reach me at home. I was on two corporate boards. I did a little bit of teaching at the law firm, so I never stepped out entirely, um, and I think that was helpful. The other is twofold, and one part of it is that in, in all that you hear today and every place else and from your mentors and from your sponsors, you should be, you should be taking in the, all of this really good information and different opinions, but at some point, you really have to shut out the noise. And you have to, I, I would never, for a whole variety of reasons, I would never recommend to anybody that they take my career path, because it was so crazy and crooked that <laughs> I don't know that anybody could duplicate, that I could even duplicate it again, but, it's more because these are, the decision I made when I stepped back from practice was so intensely personal that I can never presume that someone would have all the same reasons or thoughts about it that I had. But what you do have to do is shut out, once you get all the information, you have to shut out all the noise and hear yourself think so that you make your own decision. And, and, and the other is it takes a little bit of blind faith I just was kind of optimistic. It never occurred to me that I wouldn't be able to do something later on and then something dropped into my lap. So I guess the, the final thing I would say about it is you not only have to recognize there's luck that plays into a lot of this, um, but you have to recognize the luck when it happens. And when a lucky break comes, you have to sit back, recognize you, you've been handed a lucky break, and run with it. So. Um, but, but again, I, I think the most important thing I've learned in all of my life is, is to quiet the noise. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. And what I'd say is always remember what is really important to you. If you don't know, figure it out. Um, because you're going to have to live with whatever choice you make. Um, and I can tell you that there were times when I was offered jobs that I wrestled with it. And oh my god, this would be a promotion. But my husband had just gotten the promotion. And that would not have really been good for him, you know, if I were to take this job and go off to Minneapolis right now. Um, and I made that choice. I said, you know, it's better for us because that was for me what was the most important thing. Then when it came time for me to be asked to move to Europe, you know what? I turned down jobs for him. He was saying, no, it's your turn. It's, you can do that. 
So it's really for me, my family is what is my husband and my family is what's most important for me. And from, I understand that there are choices that I might eventually lose from as a result of that, but I'm willing to live with that um, because that's the right choice. Yeah, I, I, what I told people is, you know, I can get another job. I can't get another Sherman. That's, that's it. right. And, uh, and so that's it. You know? I'm going to meet someday. I, I love so, Sherman already. <laughs> that's it. So and that's what you have to you have to know. Any other any other questions? Come up to the mic, please. <laughs> I think Laura mentioned this morning that she has some mandates or Kodak has some mandates and what they look for in terms of diversification and gender representation for outside counsel. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering in terms of driving change, which I think is one of your topics, what any of you have done in terms of your requirements on those issues for your outside counsel? We have um, things that our outside counsel must do. Um, we have what we call the Lilly Preferred Outside Counsel Group. So we have people come and they um, they have to bid for our business. Uh, we do it about every three years, and you know we and we have criteria that we establish. You know we of course need litigation counsel, we need SEC counsel, we need you know all the different books of business that we need to have. But part of that is to make sure that they do have diversity um, in the people that represent us. We we really do believe that, particularly if we're going before a jury someplace that is in a uh, we want th to have a representative uh, group of folks because we believe that the, the more diverse thought that there is in a given uh, group, the better uh, our, our results are going to be. So we want that diversity not only uh, from a gender perspective, from a racial perspective, uh, and we have, I mean, we give very staunch feedback to firms. We've kind of said this is what we want. If they don't do it, they may not be, and we they may not be our preferred counsel anymore. And they've gotten to a point where they believe us. So we're getting there. And, and you know, from the outside provider's <laughs> perspective, that just proves the point that, you know, diversity is good business. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. diversity now is essential business. If you're um, a provider of legal services, financial services, and you can't field a diverse team, then you're not in the game. Mm -hmm. So you just gotta do it, which means you have to have, um, you know, a high quality bench. Um, of individuals that represent a cross-section of everyone. I think um, what I've done since I've gone in-house is I, I look at the talent on the outside and, and I basically, you know, was in a law firm and, and know how important it is um, that client feedback get back to the people who make decisions in, in the course of your advancement for the firm. So what I've done is if I see a really talented um, lawyer, regardless of gender, but often I, it, I tend to do this more, more frequently with the women I come across, I write um, letters <laughs> to the firm, managing partner, that say, I can't tell you how fabulous this person is, and here's why. And so I just have made a decision to take a personal interest in the advancement of some of the lawyers who've serviced our accounts, and I think it makes a big difference. <laughs> You've um, talked a lot about mentorship and sponsorship at this point, but one of the things I found interesting for young lawyers in particular is the skill and the art of managing up effectively and strategically, and I wondered if each of you could just mention briefly some either instances or skills and strategies for managing up effectively. I think for me, um, it's being um, willing to speak up and challenge. Uh, I can tell you one of the first uh, experiences I had with my first boss uh, there, you know, you go in and you talk to your boss and you say, this is a problem that we have. And, and I would try to start telling, you know, what I thought about this and how I'd analyzed and she'd always kind of say, well, you do ABC. After about the third time, I said, you know what, if I really didn't come in here with a thought you should really fire me, All right? And letting her understand that, you know, really I had a plan and you just kind of walked over me and didn't really want to listen to it, so really you should listen. But being willing to, to have that open and honest conversation with people and if they are doing things that are maybe not, um, that are shutting you down or shutting down other people on the team, being that person 
um, that will actually speak up to that for folks so that they can you know, kind of say, well, you know, that's right. Uh, but do it in a way that uh, is saying, I really want to really make sure that you don't have to do all the work and that people don't come back to you all the time. Really, I've, I've actually spent some time thinking through this and, and that kind of thing. So managing it up from that perspective and um, just, yeah, that's it. So, so I think that, yeah, mm -hmm. I think that um, managing up involves a couple of things. Judgment, mm -hmm. picking your battles, um, and, and picking the place you work because um, in order to be able to effectively manage up, you have to be comfortable speaking up. Mm -hmm. and, and so I actually had a situation at one point in my career in which the senior person was really destroying the atmosphere of the place. And I ended up, the, the organization had gone from one that I really enjoyed to one that I didn't enjoy quite as much. And, and I had a decision to make. And my decision was that I was going to speak up about it because if it fell flat, I wasn't in the right place. And if it didn't fall, fall flat, maybe I could do some good. And he actually came back to me and thanked me for helping him understand that the way he was communicating with people was really detrimental to the whole atmosphere. So yeah, I was lucky. Um, but but I say, as I say, I think that you have to, it was a battle worth picking for me. And it was a battle that I figured I didn't lose either way, because either the place was improving or I was going to find some new, nice new place to work. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're about the solution and about making things better, I think that that serves, you know, you can't be, from, from my perspective, I don't mind people challenging, but don't just challenge. Come to me with some good things of how we're going to fix this. Right. Uh, and I think that that's the, the, the key yeah. to making sure that people see you as a change agent and someone that is wanting to do something positively. To For the whole the organization. <laughs> yeah. Any, mm -hmm. any last words? Well, you, you know you're on to something good when each panel gets better and better and better. Uh, there are two breakout sessions. I think we give you a chance to either stay.